And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. One of the most commonly spoken phrases in the whole Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. But that other verse that I read, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that's John 3, 14, and we don't hear it very often. From the very beginning, we were created in a loving relationship with God. The entire story of the life of Jesus is God recovering that original intent. The story of creation begins with that good news, a loving relationship with God. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are being written into the story again in the original relationship that God intended. Because God loves first. What about these two phrases? I mean, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We see it all over the place on t-shirts, on bumper stickers, on memes, on greeting cards. But I say to you, where's the John 3, 14 shirt? And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That could be a pretty cool design for a t-shirt, honestly. And I say that a little jokingly, but also to think about how we can be so familiar with one phrase in the Bible and know almost nothing about what comes right before or right after it. You know, we zoom in so close, right? On one piece, one tiny piece, one phrase, one statement, we miss the broader context of the life of Jesus and the love of God. So let's first just zoom out a little and look at what's happening overall in this third chapter of John. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the teachers of religion, specifically Judaism in that time. The Pharisees today, they're often looked down upon. But the truth for that time is they were the religious leaders, the clergy, much like I am today. Jesus has come to the temple during the Passover festival. The tables have been overturned. And in chapter 3 of John, Jesus is talking with this religious leader. The conversation documented is back and forth in the first part of chapter 3. And then when we arrive at the part where our text began today, it's just Jesus speaking. The last question that Nicodemus asks Jesus before Jesus begins this longer response is, how can these things be? Part of Jesus's response and where our text began is, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And to understand what Jesus is saying, we have to zoom out so far that we see the teachings that Nicodemus would have already understood the story of Moses from Numbers 21. Before we go there, though, let's zoom out on our own journey and review where we've already been in Lent. First, we had that again and again, we are invited in. Then again and again, God meets us. Again and again, we are called to listen. Again and again, we are shown the way. We are invited in. God meets us. We are called to listen, we are shown the way, and again and again, God loves first. And then next, we look at where are we going? What comes after this? Again and again, we are reformed. Again and again, we draw on courage. Again and again, we are held together. Again and again, we find ourselves here. Again and again, the sun rises. The story of Jesus redefines love. The life of Jesus redefines love. Because again and again, God loves first. In Numbers, the story that Jesus references, Moses has followed God's instructions, leading the people away from Egypt. They weren't thriving in Egypt. The conditions were poor. They were enslaved. And even though they're following God, they begin complaining. They want to go back to the way things were. They want to go back to what they know, where they felt like they were comfortable, 
with better food. It really says that. It says, we detest this miserable food. One of the commentators I listened to this week said, this is a time where we especially want to watch out for the going back to Egypt sentiments as we decide how we proceed as things reopen. And in every era and every church, there is always a going back to Egypt committee. So here they are complaining. And then a bunch of poisonous snakes bite the people. The people realize their words and their actions have been sinful and they repent. They recognize and they admit. And Moses prays for them and God responds, make a poisonous serpent and set it up on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. There's a term in Latin that is used by some early theologians and then by Luther. It's incurvatus ense. It means to curve in on oneself. It was used to refer to what happens when we allow things like sin, remorse, regret, grief. We slowly curve in. And that state of being, it's one that's difficult to talk about. We slowly start to curve in on ourselves, shutting out the world. And the opposite is the term ex curvatus exe, meaning opening outwardly, opening outwardly, lifting up, looking outward. So with Moses and this snake reference, it's talking about people literally looking upwards. So their face is pointing up to look at this snake to be saved. And it's hard to look up while you're curving in. You almost have to do the ex curvatus ex se, open up to look up. Lifting up, lifting up the cross, it's more than just the resurrection. It is also our own response. It isn't just about the event of what happened on the cross. It's about what it can mean for us as we look towards it and as we look towards Easter. The crucifixion is Jesus joining in our suffering. But if the story stops there, we have a God who suffers along with us. We have a God that we can lift our faces up to and appreciate. But the resurrection is the proof that Jesus is God. So let me say that again. The crucifixion gives us something to look up to. But the resurrection, the coming up from death, is the proof that Jesus is God conquering death. So that when we look upon the cross, we also know we are looking up towards God. But again, it doesn't stop there. There's the ascension. So there's Jesus being resurrected, back walking among the disciples. But then there's the next part, the ascension. What happens after Easter, the going up to heaven. And that is what creates the way for us. It creates the way for us to also be in relationship with God. The story doesn't end at Easter or else we would just have a God who suffers for us. The ascension completes and creates this ongoing, permanent relationship with God in love that is possible for us. But to look up, we have to recognize, we have to recognize some of the circumstances we are in because we love the darkness. What circumstances we are in because we have chosen to stay in the darkness. Just like the people of Egypt recognized what they were doing and repented, so do we. And that is hard. God loves first, though. But we don't want to look at the things that hurt. Looking at those things, looking deeply, it's needed, though, for healing. Looking at God, really looking at that cross, means looking at ourselves. Looking at God means admitting where we want forgiveness. 
It means asking for repentance. So what difference does it make? What difference does it make to worship a God who loves? God's unbending us and pointing us in new directions. God is unbending us, opening us up so we don't close in on ourselves. It's that focus on ourselves, that curving inward that is burst open so we can put that focus on God, so we can look up at the serpent that heals, so we can look to Christ and look away from ourselves. But you have to actually look up. God isn't going to force you to look. You can dwell in the darkness. People love darkness. It's why some of us love online worship because it's harder to get ready for church. It's harder to go to church however you feel comfortable. It's harder to go to church, sit next to someone in pajamas, or sit near someone crying as their heart breaks, to sit near someone who hasn't had access to enough water for drinking, let alone for cleaning themselves. It is harder to show up and be present and be grateful that these siblings in Christ feel comfortable enough to worship God among us, however they arrive. People love being hidden because it's easier. It's harder to say, come as you are, and then really accept people as they are. But from the very beginning, we were created in a loving relationship with God that says, come as you are. The entire story of the life of Jesus is God recovering the original intent of a loving relationship. As I said earlier, the story of creation begins, the story of the whole Bible, begins with the good news of a loving relationship with God. And we are being written into that story again and again, into the original relationship that God intended. And in the Ephesians text, we read Paul's explanation of this. Reading mostly just the nouns, we hear these words, mercy, love, trespasses, grace, heavenly places, riches, grace, kindness, grace, faith, gift, way of life. So how are you going to respond? How are you going to live? Are you going to live in the light? Are you going to live in this love? Because what's at stake is a mutual relationship. And for a relationship to be mutual, you have to respond. And that's the moment we are talking about here. How are we responding to this love from God? Because what's at stake is being lifted up into a divine love with a God who again and again loves first. Amen.